hump day. Hi, Tracy. Happy hump day. How is everything? It's good. I was just going to think if I've got anything to share. Anything. I went to the Hunter Valley the weekend. That was nice. You went to what? The Hunter Valley. Oh, very. Did you now? I did, yeah. Oh, very nice. Amazing lunch. It was one of those kind of like four little courses with matching wines. I think it was like five courses. Beautiful. Oh. It was lovely. And what was that in celebration of? It wasn't. It was just to get out of the city. I had not been oh. anywhere in ages. I feel like I hadn't been anywhere. So it was just a long weekend. It was lovely. Mm. And we had really beautiful, you know, that summer, winter, like not summer, the sunny, sunny winter day. It was beautiful. Yeah. And I was allowed to take Hendy. So we sat on like a, like a deck with a heater and the sun and the dog. It's really nice. Gorgeous. Yeah. Who was that with? Oh, uh, my friend Diana. We went oh. for the weekend. Oh, Diana. Mm. Oh, so did she, did she take her two doggies as well? Yes. So we had three doggies and it was hilarious because she told me, I'll bring the chariot. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I bring the oh, chariot. Oh God! It's like dogs. A, yeah, pram. It's like a pram. It's like a pram. Yeah, it's like a pram. And I was like, oh my goodness, really? She's like, no, yeah, Georgie. It's so good. And like, she needed it because what happened? She has those extendable leads. Oh, and yeah, they just yeah. they're all over the place. They're all over so, the place. Yeah. So it was good because what happens is she just puts them in there and they just sit still and just together oh she had a little blankie and everything yeah so that was really good (laughs) very nice nice. that's well deserved very good beautiful that's what i did and did you do a bit of wine tasting or no just just the lunch (laughs) oh i went to one place because i've been to hunter valley several times Mm, and so i've kind of you know done most of it not most of it because a lot of wineries but there was one that I hadn't been to that somebody recommended. It's the uh, McGuigan family. Mm. You know, the McGuigan's quite famous mm-hmm. for wine. Lisa McGuigan has her own. She's like part of the family, famous family of wines. And she's got her own cellar door. Yeah. And I hadn't been. And somebody said, oh, you have to go. And it's very gothic, very Game of Thrones kind of themed cool. place. Um, yeah. and not even the wineries make an effort it's not a kind of boring yeah building it's yeah. very very yeah. and they've got your own like private like cordoned off areas for having a tasting in groups yeah. and even one of the wine bottles had a velvet label okay velvet very goth label. yeah very goth it was very gothic it was a very cool place environment and everything so it did we went there but then we just went back to our place we had a hot tub waiting yeah i mean <laughs> who needs wine tasting when you've got a hot i love hot tubs love i them. love hot tubs they are mm. the best very yeah. nice oh that's good you spoil yourself a bit yeah what about you what have you been doing well i had a mutual friend from australia visit now as you know and uh, yeah that was fantastic but it did make me homesick so <laughs> come home Oh, yeah, we know. Yeah, so it didn't, you know, it's all rough. Yeah, but anyway, no, it was really lovely seeing her. And as always, it's really lovely to have visitors. And I love that people make the effort to come out here and visit us. So very special, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was good to hang out. So that's what I've been up to. Back to work now. Yes, (laughs) back to reality. It's nice to have little breaks, isn't it? exactly mm, that's definitely. it you can't just work all the time and while I remember last time because we talked about last time I mentioned about a guy who was blind and he can cycle and do all you know he lives a very adventurous life a very oh, yes. full life yes he can learn this like different skills and ways to navigate the world but one of his was skills it clicking? Is, like, is it clicking? Yeah, the clicking. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a sonar thing that he, he's got going on. And I said I would I would look it up. It's, it's a guy called Daniel Kitch. And Daniel I originally Kitch. heard his story on conversations on the ABC on their podcast. 
So Daniel has also done a TED talk. So if you prefer to watch the TED talk, then that's some um, something to do. But he's an amazing guy, and has overcome obviously the obstacle of being blind, and a really inspirational person. Really, like you're not like that standing in his way. So yeah, yeah. thriving in his life. Yeah, mm. exactly. So really nice to hear and see those types of stories. Hey, I have a story. So, what have we got? I've got a story which does not show our evolution very well as a species, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. Uh, it's a recent story and it's from ABC News. Now imagine you sat in your garden. Actually, in Sydney, where I live, there's a lot of apartment living. Cities, a lot of cities have apartment living. Of apartment living, shared spaces, that kind of thing. Imagine you're sitting there, chilling out in your homeware. Is it called at homeware? You know, when everybody went mad for buying home, wearing like trackies, yeah, like jacky clothes because you're just at home. <sighs> oh, well, if you, yeah, I suppose if you're a bit more upmarket, it will be active wear, wouldn't it? Active wear, yeah, whatever you like. And Somebody else that potentially lives there is like, doesn't recognize you, hasn't seen you before, and they're like, Who are you? I think you're trespassing, right? So, this is what happened to a man in Canberra. The story is Canberra man accuses police of racial profiling after arrests were trespassing at his own home. That's what happened. So, a Canberra man has lodged a formal complaint with ACT, which is policing, after he was arrested, handcuffed and put into the back of a police vehicle because police assumed he was trespassing. Tuck is his name, who does not wish to be identified by his full name, believes he was the victim of racial profiling. That's crazy. I it know. says that I can't believe that you can be arrested for trespassing in your own home. Exactly. Where um, you live. And it took place, like, this is weeks ago. This is a story from last week. So this took place in June 2024. So it took place in his apartment complex. And he was recovering from an emergency cardiac issue at hospital, at the hospital stay. And he decided to go, so he's at home, decided to sit by the pool barbecue area within his apartment complex, get some sun. And it's about lunchtime. It goes on to say, I don't know why this is relevant, but it's interesting that this is part of the story. It goes on to say that he's got multiple degrees, including a master's, works in health policy for a Canberra organisation, was wearing a hoodie and slippers and fleece track, track pants at the time. And he says a neighbour who'd been outside washing their car approached him and began demanding answers about what he was doing. And he says he was confused at the question because... I wasn't sure if he was asking about, you know, my ethnic origin or whether he was asking about if I live within the complex. So I think he was being asked, where are you from? So no, hi, good morning, or hi, no, hi, nothing like that. Just where are you from? And then I'd be confused. I'm always confused by that question, to be honest. Because mm. when there's somebody asking that question, I'm like, are they asking me why I'm black? Are they asking me why my accent's not Australian? Are they asking me where I live in Sydney? I don't know what they're asking me. Anyway, I get that kind of confusion. And while he was confused, trying to understand the question, this person said, you're not supposed to be here. And took, said from then on, the neighbour became increasingly discourteous. And when he refused to tell him where he lived and began asking his neighbour for the same details, when his neighbour told him he was going to call the police, took told him to go ahead believing they would protect him from his neighbor's harassment. Within 15 minutes, Tuck said, five police officers and three cars arrived to the complex, which he called an extraordinary overreaction. So three officers approached him and began questioning him about where he lived. He responded by pointing to his house, which backs onto the shared barbecue and pool facilities, and verbally telling the officers where it was located. Tuck said his response wasn't acknowledged by police, who instead began asking him for photo identification. 
He says, I didn't have my photo ID for obvious reasons. I was at home. I wouldn't carry my ID with me at home. He explained. I said, I did have my keys. The keys, you know, by which I exited my townhouse and the pool key by which I unlocked the swimming pool. But the officers wouldn't accept this at all so they'd need to see photo ID. I was offended at the suggestion that they would enter my house, he said. There was no search warrant. There was no report that there was anything illegal that they needed to search for in my house, he said. Tuck admitted he wasn't in a hurry to move when he was told to get up, but did so and complied with their request. He said he began to get nervous at this point, given the kind of police response he had so far received, even asking the officers if they were going to shoot him. Shortly after that, they began to basically escort me out of the barbecue area and didn't take kindly to that because I had a lawful right to be in the barbecue area, Tuck told the ABC. As Tuck was escorted out of the barbecue area, he began filming the interaction. He said at that point, he and the officers were engaged in a back and forth argument. It says here, the ABC has seen the footage. Police say officer was injured. Took alleges things became physical when an officer grabbed his wrist saying he was doing so because he had his phone in his face. That same officer then arrested him on suspicion of trespassing. I was slammed into the fence, separating the barbecue from the swimming pool area, he said. I was restrained on my right shoulder and then they began to handcuff me behind my back. I did not resist the arrest, I just gave up. ACT policing confirmed the arrest occurred and described Tuck's behaviour leading up to it as belligerent. Due to the man's behaviour, police had reasonable suspicion the man was trespassing and he was arrested. As officers attempted to handcuff the man, he resisted, causing a minor injury to an officer's hand. But Tuck said he was in shock as he told the officers where his licence and wallet were located in his apartment and had his keys and phone taken away. During that interaction, one of the officers cut his hands. Tuck said he did not know how the injury occurred. He claimed the officer then accused him of assaulting a police officer, but the charge was not laid by police. And then during the search of his home, Tuck was locked in the police van for 10 minutes before the officers returned and Tuck was unarrested. Police have confirmed he was placed in a police vehicle while officers conducted checks on his address. No charges have been laid with police saying they believe the incident to be completed. Dealt with, done. The problem is, right. Tuck now says he feels uncomfortable in his own home. He says during the incident, the officers also questioned him about whether he was intoxicated or had consumed marijuana one saying his eyes were red and his voice appeared slurred. He told the ABC believes those assertions were intended to strengthen the profile they were trying to create. And while Tuck says one of the officers told him the arrest had nothing to do with the colour of his skin, he doesn't believe that was the case. He says they believe that I was unemployed youth, you know, potentially of African or Indigenous descent, that was enjoying amenities unlawfully, he said. I think they just hope that indeed it was a trespass to confirm the narrative they created. Looking back now, he believes the police response was an extraordinary overreaction. And he says, I suspect it was based on the description of me, the suspect said. Since the incident, Tuck said he has keenly felt the indignity of it. Although he doesn't feel unsafe at home, he does feel uncomfortable. He said, while he had experienced racism before, he believes this was the most extreme example since he moved to Australia 17 years ago from Zimbabwe. The ABC witnessed one neighbour at the complex approaching Tuck to express her dismay and shame at what had occurred. She expressed her concern and apologies and invited Tuck and his family to come over for afternoon tea. That interaction left Tuck visibly emotional and he was hopeful it could form part of any story about his arrest. He also said he hoped his complaint would end up being treated seriously and investigated. And then the story goes on about what the police have said. And they yeah, said he was belligerent. Slowly, I'm just reading part of this now, Tracy, is that the ABC said that they've reviewed the footage. Mm -hmm. But then they're not, they're kind of saying, Tuck said this, the police said that, as if 
like as part of their reporting, but they're not really like saying what they saw in the footage, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and also the police were wearing body cameras. That's what I mean. So the police, ABC has said they've seen this footage, the body cam footage. No, no, no. Made public. So he was filming it on his phone. Oh, okay. And that's how the police were like, oh, you, the phone's in my face, and then they make okay, that. Okay, I thought they may have like... seen the body cam footage. But still, I'm kind of a bit frustrated with the article because the ABC are not saying what they actually saw. No, they're not. In the footage, um, yeah, but maybe they're not pending a, an investigation. I sure, they can report on what they see. There, I mean, that's what journalists do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why, why they couldn't do that. I didn't do that. But the police are saying he was belligerent. I get what he meant, but I would be belligerent. Exactly. He's why you would feel like affronted by this. You've been yeah. in your home, imagine. Well, there's multiple things there because you're like, somebody's called the police on me. What the yes. F for a start? Yeah. I'm just sat here by the pool. Yeah. And then, what was it? Three police Three police cars. Yeah. I mean, that's just astounding. Well, do you know what I'd be interested to know? What was actually reported? What did exactly. the man, what well, did they say? This is it. It's whatever was said. And yeah. they're saying it wasn't racially profiled, but I feel like I can almost bet my life on it that there's a black man by my pool that shouldn't be there or whatever, right? Yeah. The word black man. For sure. Is why I feel like three cars felt like they needed to turn up. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it wouldn't take much... why three cars would turn up. It wouldn't take much to investigate that, really. You just need the footage and what was reported. As to me, I mean, I don't know how, and I can totally understand him being belligerent. I'd be belligerent. Yeah, I, I, it's not really yeah. denying that he was not fully. I mean, he accepted the arrest, but he wasn't like. He was pissed off. I'd be pissed off. Who wouldn't be pissed yeah. off? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think like the NGC police police chief here. Chief Police Officer Scott Lee defending the actions of the officers. I, I think they need to provide a little bit more evidence as to why he's, you know, supporting their action. Because it's this these types of little little issues mm. that become like these behaviors, sorry, these little aggressive behaviors that can become part of a culture mm. if it's not addressed. If you understand, am I kind of explaining properly? Like a policing culture, if it's yeah. not addressed when things like this happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's scary, Tracy, actually. Yeah, but I just can't imagine how, also how it got, you know, escalates. I'm just telling you now. Oh, I just don't know what I'm even saying. Because I just think, how would that have been handled if it was a white person? Well, this is the whole point. That's what he's kind of getting at, isn't he? The guy, it's like, feels mm. like it's, if there's a white man sat by my pool, you'd probably not even get a policeman coming in. You'd hope that, that even if the police turned up for something like that, that it would be a civil conversation. Hey, we've had a complaint. We're just here to check that you actually are meant to be here. Can you show us some proof? Yeah, and actually it could have been, you know, We'll just come with you while you get your ID. It didn't sound it was yeah, like that kind five of thing. Yeah, five it's of us. Five of us. So, yeah. so already it's intimidating. Five police well, officers yeah. for one person. Yeah. So I don't know what I'd be thinking that if five people said five. Well, I'd be thinking what the F. Actually, you probably wouldn't want them to be coming to your apartment. You'd be thinking no. what's going to happen inside my apartment. Exactly. That's what I mean. One one officer will accompany you. They don't need to go in your apartment, do they? Yeah. Just accompany you to your door while you go and get your ID. And we'll clear yeah. that up. And you know, sorry five, for any inconvenience. Five, ones, five batons. Yeah, you exactly. You wouldn't be yeah. like, oh, yeah, let's all go to my house. Because the thing is, they're not nicely asking, are they? They're already being met with antagonistic behaviour, even yeah. if it's, they're doing yeah. their job. I don't know if you've come across the police in Australia, but, I mean... I've had some very nice interactions with police in Australia, but the gear that they wear, 
you know, you take an ordinary man and then you put them in all the police gear and the police Ooh. stance and the, you know, all of a sudden that ordinary man starts to look a little bit more intimidating, but quite, quite a lot more intimidating actually once they've got all the, yeah, you know, everything on them. So, yeah, I can imagine that, well, I think three of them approached him or questioned him. That's already like a bit too much, isn't it? Yeah. I think people need to understand a little bit more about the psychology behind that. Of course, you're going to be belligerent when you've got three hefty looking police officers stood over you and you're in a deck chair with mace and whatever else to carry. <laughs> I'm All just the like, other things I carry. Of course you yeah. are. Exactly. That's what I'm, that's my point. See the dynamics and the psychology of that? Yeah. Especially, they I need mean, to do better, climate. don't they, really? It needs to do better. Um, rather than escalating situations, it needs to be a down, down. I just feel down. like what kind of training do they, what kind of training do they get? Honestly. Well, I yeah, but I suppose on a day-to-day basis, they aren't dealing with guys like Tuck, you know. No. On a so day-to-day day basis, right. dealing with all kinds of a lot different situations. And situations. And yeah, yeah, I so get I that. That's where the training is, but there should also be training for Ola, you know, if the situation's looking like it's a, a guy in his tracksuit in a deck chair, then mm. there's a different way of handling things. Yeah, exactly. Ugh. But anyway, that, <laughs> that story just pressed me like you wouldn't believe when I read that. What was he in his slippers as well or something? Oh, yeah, something slippers. Like that. Slippers. I mean, it should have been an indication, right? Okay, there's a guy sat here in his slippers. Oh, he might actually live here is probably what you could be thinking. Well, that that's the other thing, that person. <laughs> what were they thinking? And even they, and even if they were trespassing, they would have sat there. Yeah, that's what really me. pisses me off as well. That no egregious behaviour there. Egregious behaviour. Mm. Okay, all right, so let's uh, move on to that. Completely different topic. This is in the Hindustan Times, and it's um, talking about how divorce in Sweden um, is boosting gender equality. So actually, I did not know this, and maybe you did, I'm not sure, but divorce rate in Sweden is amongst the highest in the world, which is shocking. I don't know why. I don't know why. I feel like just would never have guessed that they would have the highest divorce rate. No. And, but it's also, um, Sweden now is world leading when it comes to splitting child custody 50-50. So obviously as a result of the divorces, couples that are splitting up, who have had children, have had to come to some kind of custody agreement. And it seems like Sweden leading the world in arranging 50-50 custody instead of, oh, you know, the child or children are with the mother most of the time and then goes to the dad every other weekend, which you know happens quite a lot of the time as well. So saying that almost half of children with separated parents now split their time equally between the two households. And the article is kind of has the idea that maybe this will lead to more gender equality in general when I guess when when children are seeing that, you know, they're experiencing that kind of 50-50 sharing, caregiving from mother and father, that the idea is that maybe in a a generation or two, that will become more normalised than what it is now. Um, Because opposite sex couples in Sweden and generally in the world tend to fall into the manager-helper dynamic. So that's, you know, where the mother takes on the more full scape role um, takes on the mental load, the physical load of having a job, having a family, juggling a household, and then delegates specific tasks for the father to fulfill. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the manager's taking, you know, the woman's taking on the management type role, covering off and reading, and then asking for help as and when the father or the male figure can contribute. Mm-hmm. But a 50 50 living arrangement turns this kind of manager-helper dynamic on its head because it no longer is possible for, well, for men to kind of give up on their responsibilities. If it's a 50-50 custody arrangement, then they have to take on 50-50 of those responsibilities. 
And they've said that they've used various data, but one of the strongest pieces of data they use is to look at the number of days off that individuals take off for work to look after their children. And they say in Sweden, divorce has led to an increase in fathers taking more of a share of days off um, for care of children, whereas previously it would have been like more of the mother's role to yeah, leave work early because the child is sick or mm. take time off because it's school sports day or whatever it is. Yeah. And the lesson for us all is that men can and do look after children when they need to, you know, they can look after their own children. So, mm. you know, that's the other thing that the article addresses as well, that there's also that feeling of they can't do it. You know, I'm the woman, I'm the mother, I can do this, but the father needs to be kind of managed or have oversight or whatever. And the article then goes on to say that the more we see men looking after their children, the more normal it mothers who take time off to stay home with their kids. And mothers may find it easier to trust their partners to take on more childcare and housework. And this is good news, not only for women who suddenly proclaim that for the first time ever, ex-husbands are doing their fair share, but also for men who no longer have to deal with the pain associated with the feeling of losing their children after a separation. Yeah. And of course, you know, the article saying, you know, divorce is never a good thing, but at least in Sweden, then moving towards a place that it's, yeah, bringing other positives, like at a gender equality in other ways. Right. I think that's pretty much the long and short of it. Yeah. Um, I, but yeah, it's still kind of astounding, really, to think that that's not the norm. It's like, it's kind of, it's sad. I'm like, I hear quite a lot of narrative around this whole flexible working, people asking for that. And I'm hearing, you know, men are asking, you know, to be able to, to arrive later or finish early to pick up kids from school and that kind of thing. And a lot of, employees are pushing back on that still and I just find that quite interesting that attitude uh, because it's a man maybe it's like it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman and they still have that attitude but ultimately people not all people have children I mean I'm not one of the people that have had children but most families have children and it's a shared responsibility and yes maybe the how they decide to divide the responsibility is up to the individuals but it mm. annoys me that it's assumed that the woman is the primary carer when both parents work full time. Yeah, mm. that's absolutely correct. Mm. That just absolutely drives me bonkers. And, mm. you know, both men and women are guilty of accepting that, you know, societal norm. I, you know, there's mm. women that won't even let their partners take on more responsibility sometimes when it comes to their kids. Um, yeah. And also when there's a custody challenge, one of the people in my networking group is a family lawyer, so it's quite interesting hearing, you know, her talk about these types of things, that there's some sort of legal precedent for, depending on the age of the child, especially the very young, for the mother to get most, the majority of the time, which I don't agree with personally. I don't see mm. what difference it makes, which parent, as long as both parents are parents, like, you know, you know, yeah, no I really think it cannot be healthy. And again, generalizing here, general sweeping statements, but I can't see how it can be healthy for children either. You know, why would they, as a child, only want to see one of their parents for, you know, two days every month mm. or whatever, you know, the arrangement becomes like it. Yeah, well, it was as children. As well. I used to see my dad on a Sunday from like three yeah. years old so I just thought that was the way it was because you think this is the way it is but also so this I get so I get annoyed when men think that that's what they do and they're like kind of remove responsibility but for yeah. some men they don't want that either some men want to have 50 percent, and they should yeah they should exactly. be able to have it but you know a lot of men think that's acceptable they've got less responsibility now than it with their partner and that's that's okay yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's very I mean, it can't always be possible to be equal. I understand, like, when people get divorced, there's all kinds of financial considerations that go into it. You know, one person might stay in the family home. 
It makes more sense that the children would therefore, that would be their home that they would stay in most of the time. Mm. But it is also, yeah, I mean, wherever possible, 50-50 seems like that's how it should be. Yeah. It should be that one parent has, yeah, more access to their children than another. Yeah. I mean, and I've seen both sides to it as well. I had a friend that they had that 50-50 relationship. This was in Australia when they split up. And it was brilliant. I mean, it worked really well. For, like she, she loved it because it meant that she could still reclaim some of her life back mm. and have her interests and her friends. And yeah, she loved it and was able to mm. get, you know, have her children move on after divorced life, start afresh, being, you know, yeah, have her own interests and everything. So. And then I've yeah. seen the other other way as well where, you know, women take on the majority of the role in a couple of days every month, they, yeah. um, you know, yeah. Because it's like a lot say, to be a parent. That's a lot. Like, not to have a break is, yeah. is, is a big deal. It is a big deal. So, you know, it can be complicated depending on circumstances. But I agree with you as well. I think 50-50 should be more than, or, than it is. And unfortunately, men and women have these ideas about women should have the, the kids should have most of the care responsibility. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. There's a lot of things that don't make sense, but people will find arguments to support their beliefs, which is kind yeah. of funny how yeah. they justify it. If you've got loving parents, that's that's what you need mm. at the end yeah. of the day. Why wouldn't you want to spend as much time with both? Unless one of your parents was very different. I don't know. Yes. Yes. But I don't know about that Swedish fact, because I just had a quick Google, and I can't find anywhere, any source that suggests Sweden has the highest divorce rate. I found historical data that suggests it was like the Maldives or... It was among the highest, not the highest, but yeah. Well, I'm looking at top tens. I don't see it even in the top 10. But this data I'm looking at is like from 2021. So maybe that's changed. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. Oh, because I was wondering then what are the other countries? So I thought I'd have a quick Google. So what's the highest of Maldives? It was something like that. Yeah, something like Maldives or somewhere. And like other countries up there that, you know, like Russia and Belgium, they're the kind of countries up there with the divorce. Russia. Interesting. Yeah, was, um... I tell you what, I'm quite surprised at the number of people that divorced in Italy, you know, being historically a very Catholic country. Yeah. I've been quite surprised, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Maybe it's really easy to get divorced in some countries. That might be There might be a lot more people separated in other countries that don't actually get That's divorced. True. That's true. You know, Apparently know. the lowest countries are like India, places like that. But also yeah. it's like the consequences of divorce can mean homelessness for some women. Yeah, there's the social, cultural. Yeah, there's economic. lots of reasons why people stay yeah. married yeah. when they shouldn't be, which is really sad as well. Exactly. All right, then. Shall we move on then to this story? Okay. Which I found funny. We kind of talked about this kind of topic before in a different way. We talked about representation in the media essentially um mm-hmm. and this story uh, is also abc news and the t- title is from blondes with biggies to housewives are we getting better at the way we portray women in ads and then i'm starting to think oh yeah i think so but i mean we were kids when i think the worst offenders were out and about in terms of advertising so the article yeah. goes on to say when Cammie O'Keefe landed her first job as a creative in advertising almost 25 years ago, oh, I would have been 20, 20-ish then, the casting brief called for a blonde with biggies. And she says, I kid you not, that was the wording verbatim, she says. There was also the mentality of, many, of the men in charge, bosses were predominantly men back then when it came to female representation. It was, at times, sexist and demeaning. 
Mm. With over two decades of experience, fellow panelist on ABC's Gruen, Emily Taylor, has a similar story to tell. Once upon a time, women were only cast in supporting roles or if the lead role only as a one-dimensional hygiene-obsessed Stepford Wives in household cleaning ads. So have advertisements changed the way they portray women? And if they have, has it been for the better? Since her first brief, Cami is pleased to see most ads have improved. We've absolutely made progress in how women are represented throughout our campaigns, she says. It's far from perfect for sure, but I can say with confidence you would never receive an overtly sexist brief like that anymore. Karen Ferry, another regular on Gruen, points out that diversity in ads has also improved over her almost two decades in the advertising business. She says, right now we're seeing a more diverse representation of women casting in age, appearance, cultural background. You can't really pinpoint the moment it felt better, but the fact I am no longer offended on a daily basis is an excellent sign she says so that's funny or she's desensitized (laughs) yeah or we're desensitized yeah that's the other thing that happens right you get desensitized so it's like who's doing the housework in our ad with overtly sexist casting gradually becoming a thing of the past progress can be seen in the way advertising now tackles household chores brands are making moves to depict more balanced gender roles in their advertising Great, knowing that the tired tropes of mum in the kitchen and dad in the shed just won't cut it these days. You can see Mm. this in all the little executional traces being made down to male hands loading the dishwasher. The small but important details that get considered when making an ad to make sure a brand meets community expectations. And more recently, the car industry has recognised women as major purchasers and decision makers when it comes to buying cars showing that women don't only do school drop, but also like a car with a bit of zoom and are also content behind the wheel of a 4x4. But it's ads for feminine hygiene products that have seen the biggest change. So they talk about the taboos with women's menstrual products in advertising Mm. um, and some that were actually banned because they were seen to be too um, graphic. And they give some examples... In 2019, a cellular care advertisement for Libra period pads was the first to show blood in a feminine hygiene ad. Ad standards, which handles complaints against the advertising industry, went on to receive more than 600 objections about that ad. So I guess what they're saying is progress has happened and there's room for more progress. They're saying despite Mm -hmm. the progress that's been made, women still often play the supporting role. Women are either a mother, a daughter, a wife, a girlfriend, an employee and that role is often played in the universe of a man mm. so um you still see stereotypes resurface in ads whereas that's not all we are um, yeah and she says it's be good to have more women having greater say in what stories are told then shaping how we tell them will lead to better more balanced representation in ads um, yeah. The Advertising Council Australia's recent census found that the leadership of creative departments in advertising agencies skewed towards men by almost 70%. Yeah. And actually, when I did that ad, I was in that. When I did that, I was really surprised about how many, I don't know why I'm saying I was surprised, but I was kind of shocked that nearly everybody on the crew was a man. Mm. Yeah, and that's really probably the root root thing, isn't it? You know, because while ever the, there are men who are making these decisions about advertising, you're only like getting the male perspective. Male perspective, right? Yeah. Even yeah. if they, even if they're genuinely trying to, you know, cast the right type of, you know, female perspective, it's still from a man's point of view. So. Until there are more women in those leadership roles, it's always going to still not not be complete true representation. Exactly. And that and, and, and that's, that's the whole purpose of diversity in the first place. It's to have those different mm-hmm. perspectives shape how things are done yeah. in any workplace. That's what people just seem to miss that point, I think. 
but we really do. And the, there is some male, you know, there are stereotypes for how men think, portray women or or other, you know, there are stereotypes how people portray minorities. So that's why it's important to have those people at the table so that you can get the different perspectives. I thought it would be funny to have a quick look and see what are the worst ads, you know, that are being released into the wild. There was one here, you know, the Peloton thing. Mm. Apparently they had a recent Christmas ad and that was a scandal. They released an advert in which a woman received a new Peloton bike as a present from her husband. And she goes on to record a fitness transformation and presents the video to her loving hubby the following year. The ad was entitled The Gift That Gives Back, but was slammed by many for its misogynistic and sexist message. And what else is there? <laughs> Another oh, another campaign released this year, which needed a rethink, was the embarrassing girl boss ad. Job site people per hour came under fire in November after eagle-eyed commuters spotted several of its controversial ads popping up across London. Posters appeared on tube trains showing a picture of a woman with the tagline, you did the girl boss thing, we'll do the SEO thing. The firm was forced to apologise after the ad was slammed for its patronising and sexist message. But yeah, there's a few... There's a few listed. Yeah. It's quite funny to see. Some are, some are more subtle, but people sometimes don't understand the subtle. They think, oh, that's harmless. But they don't understand the consistently subtle suggestions, perpetuate yeah. stereotypes. Yeah, there's a few. It's like, oh, 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 But then you, yeah, you just look at advertising to see what they're suggesting. It's funny. Good. No, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because... A lot of adverts that can be quite humorous, you know. Mm, when they make actually, the stereotype, the thought that... They are. Yeah. yeah, they are exploiting the stereotype. So it's really hard because humour is a really important part of life, isn't yes, it, right? absolutely. So it is difficult to kind of... And advertisers do like to use humour because mm -hmm. it's a great way for people to connect with yeah. your brand. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so it is hard because a lot of the time in advertising, exactly what they do is they play on those stereotypes that, and we all find it very funny. But like you said, the subtle messaging isn't very funny. <laughs> yeah, and this is like it's like not necessarily easy work work rope to 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 walk because if they're too harsh, then people. This is why there's a backlash on DEI yeah. because. It's like every little thing is picked up as offensive. So I get why people are, get over it. Um, yeah. I totally get that perspective and why woke has become a bad word because everything has been put under the umbrella of woke and now it's become a dirty word. Yeah. But, so I do understand that with, if you go too extreme with things you can and can't say and do, how people just get over it and then we'll go back, mm. you know, we'll be pushed the backlash. I think that's actually what's happening, to be honest, and what's happening now. Um, but you've got to think of the bigger picture. And you're right. Funny, taking the Mickey out of stereotypes is funny, for sure. Can be totally funny. So I don't know what the answer is. There's another ad here, and it was a big, you know, when you're driving past and you see those big ad, big signs, like, you know, really big on the street somewhere. Billboard. Was, yeah, billboard. All it's right, tell you this one. This one is bad. Like some of the others were like, mm, this one is bad. So this is a billboard. And it's a woman wearing a thong, like, you know, the bum. And all you mm. see is her bum. So it's just her bum oh, on a big yeah, billboard. Yeah. And it says, oh, this is a gym in Cardiff. A gym chain called You Fit Fitness. And the billboard said, there's better things to be stuck behind than the car in front. And it's a picture of a woman's ass. And is that was for a gym? That's for a gym, because her ass yeah. is so good looking. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There's better things to be stuck behind yeah, than the car in front. Yeah, you need a gym and thong, though, do you? No. No, but you get what, what they're saying. Yeah. But that's that is quite bad, that one. I mean, the thing is, when you go to the gym 
and you see, I mean, you see some very nice men. It's kind of nice. It is nice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. This is oh, you. I get where the advertiser go in and get advertisers are going with that, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, but if you're a woman in the room, you you might could potentially offend quite a few people. <laughs> oh, of course it's offensive, yes. It's quite offensive. Did you consider that that's quite offensive? Oh, no. Too. I was like, if you if you mix this campaign and have some man's bun. Yes, it needs to be equal. It has to be it? equally yeah. offensive. I think well, that's the rule. Because, unless you're just attracting men to your gym. But then the men only women gym. Gonna be, yeah. all the women that you're going to be looking at, where are they? But this is actually supposed, I'm assuming they're targeting women as a customer because it's a woman's bum. Aren't they saying you want no, a bum like this? It's, it's better to be looking at that than being Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. Well, so, maybe, yeah. As well. True. But anyway, yeah, just like, I think if you're going to be offensive, you've got to be equal about it. And the both oh, yeah. sexes. Then it's, yeah, the, then you, yeah, the humour then. Oh, well, it's good yeah. though. Yeah. Very good. So, what would you do? Oh, yeah, what would you do? I nearly forgot. What would you do, Tracy? <laughs> if you're just, we're going, I'm going back to the story with the guy, Tuck, who we Tuck, talked about yeah. earlier. Yeah. yeah. So he was sat in his garden in his hoodie and his slippers, mm -hmm. just getting some sun. Yeah. And then he had three police cars and five police officers rock up. You've got Hendy, you're out and about in the gardens in your apartment block. And, you know, you're just doing your thing with Hendy and enjoying the garden. And then that happens to you. And, you know, you've got three burly looking police officer yeah. approaching you and asking you what are you doing here like i live here you know like the obvious thing it depends do you know what it really depends how they talk to me yeah if they talk to me like aggressively like i'm doing something wrong but if it's more of a curiosity oh you know somebody said there was somebody hanging around you know do you live here do you live here rather than what are you doing here you know it really depends on how they talk to me yeah and how I respond to them and I, I'm um, wondering as well you know I hate to say it but you you being a woman you might have been treated a bit differently to what Tuck was being treated yeah exactly which is terrible so there's that there's that element and they'll be scared as well potentially because there's where are all these people why do you need all these people that's intimidating and I know they yeah. need to be if it was a real problem. Mm. But still, there was no reports of him doing anything wrong or that man. There's no reports of him being aggressive or carrying a weapon or damaging property. There was no or breaking yeah, or somewhere. behavior or anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. has he had he showed them, he showed the police the keys. I mean, yeah. didn't have ID on him, but he had the keys to get in. He shouldn't out. have showed them his slippers. Should have just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I like, live here. Like, I live here. What do you mean? What am I doing? I'm just hanging out. I live here. That's what I'd say. But yeah, it's like it really depends how they, yeah. how they turn up. Yeah. Do you know me? I think yeah. I, I would be because that's more my natural default is to try and calm things down as opposed to get you know obstructive about things. However, I would be like, who the F reported me? Oh, I'm so know. angry. Well, I, I think that is what it would, that would really grate on me because I, I want to know which of these, <laughs> which of these idiots in this apartment block reported me because I, I want to have, I want to have to have conversation with that person. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that, totally I think that is what would really grate on me more than anything. But, I mean, he knew because that person approached him first. Ah, yes, that's true. He did. Yeah. He did. Oh, and that was, I think that was the problem because he refused to tell him anything. I mean, he didn't do himself any favours. However, it's not his fault. 
took did not do himself any favors by no. just but there's saying to there. it tends to be experienced racism and you know so oh totally you get you know, defensive. Of course you're gonna get like, defensive because, yeah yeah because it might, somebody just you know if somebody like just forget racism if somebody comes up to you um and slaps you on the face and then goes, oh, sorry, I didn't mean that, right? <laughs> You're, like, shocked, angry. Oh, you might even get angry and say something. And you tell people. And then, like, a week later, you forget it. And look like you've forgotten it. It's done, mm. right? But if you're getting slapped on the face twice a week for years and years yeah. and years. You start, with, you start wearing a face guard, don't you? You start wearing a face guard. And then if anybody comes anywhere remotely near you with their hand. Yeah, you, you'd be you're gonna be. Up. Yeah. You're really going to run away or you're going to attack. Yeah. And atta me, attack, you know, ready to fight, that fight, flight. To me, that's defensiveness uh, as a social behaviour. So what What the anger but contained? Like, what do you expect? Yeah. So I think yeah. you've got, and I think that's what's missing. When you're dealing with people that potentially experience a lot of racism, so anybody can. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta be careful how you approach them. Yeah, especially when they're not doing anything. To somebody that's never experienced that before. Yeah, complete exactly a completely different reaction to somebody who doesn't experience that on a regular basis. So that's that's what people miss. And yeah. you're right, they're doing their job. The police might be doing their job, but there was no obvious threat. Right. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. obvious crime, other than somebody potentially was trespassing by sitting at, sitting at the pool. In toxic really. situation, do you think that mm. he's doing the right thing by, you know, the formal complaint, wanting answers, wanting an investigation? Would you would you do the same thing? You know what? I don't know. I can't honestly say. Also, I'm in that situation. Because I might just want to forget about it for it to go away. And if that and if that's the case, I wouldn't probably wouldn't do anything. But so many mm. people do that. Is that the right thing to do? You know, if, if you think of the bigger picture. So that's part of me probably could do that. The other part of me could be so angry and goes, this has got to change. Mm. That I would do what he's done. But you know, he yeah. could get he could be getting harassed for all we you know now, it could be backlash from that, that he'd decide making that decision. And also, you know, people aren't going to believe him. People are going to think he's overreacting himself. And really, will it go anywhere? Anyway, mm. really. You know, will it actually go anywhere? But then I guess it's about what you can reconcile within yourself, whether you feel you've done what yeah. you can, the right thing. And I wouldn't. I think even for the fact that three police cars turned up, I feel like the ACT needs to be investigated for that. I mean, that's. That's a misuse of public funds, surely. That's a waste of police. Surely. Resource. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's not like there's an oversupply of policemen everywhere in Australia. Do you know what I mean? They... Yeah. I don't know. And like, also, if you think about it, all right, three police cars, five police officers, but only I think only three. Let me talk about cars, three. Yeah. Three cars. But then... All right, so they established, this is the question, right? They established eventually that he was telling the truth and he lived there and whatever. And they also, in their defence, to defend them, their behaviour, they're saying he was belligerent. But then wouldn't you go and talk to the person that made the complaint? I would totally be going and having a word with them if I was Yeah, that, that person should get some kind of fine or something. Well, maybe not a fine, but definitely a discussion on what made them, what, what led them to report this person mm. to give them a, maybe a bit of an awakening or an insight because this person wasn't doing anything other than sitting by the pool. Yeah. I guess it was the fact that they refused to say, I live here. I don't know if he did refuse actually, but yeah, I would. Yeah, exactly. So, well, yeah. What it's, you give out is how you can, you know, what you're going to get back, isn't it? Often. Yeah. It's about what you get. Annually what you how you approach these things and I think that and I can understand from both sides so they're saying oh mm. 
No, I'm, he's not, he's not, he was cooperating. He just wasn't being overly cooperative. And you can totally understand why. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I guess I'd be very scared if all those police turned up at my home. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. Ah, well, would you would you report it? It's like you said, you know, you, you I would be thinking, am I now just going to get harassed by the police? You know, every time I'm, you know, are they going to, every time I drive somewhere or whatever, you know, you'd be kind of feeling a little bit like that. But I, it's, it goes back to what I said earlier, though, that I feel like these little behaviors, if they're not nicked in the bud early on, they can become part of the policing culture. Mm. And, you know, you know, look what's happened in the U.S. It's just atrocious over there. Um, you know, the police are there, aren't they? They protect and serve. And yet, like in America, a lot of the black population feel very scared of the police, which is just totally... Totally wrong. So yeah, I, I would be no. I, I would want it to be. I would. I would want it to be looked at more care. Like for a start, why three cars, five policemen? You know. Yeah. Well, go right back to the beginning. Not just the the altercation that happened afterwards, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah, I I want it to be looked at to kind mm. of assess as to what can be done better because. Whether you want to call it an investigation or whatever, we can all do better. Obviously, something has occurred there that wasn't right. So, yeah, could they do better? And I think as the police chief officer, he should be coming at it from that perspective, not just closing ranks. Because, you know, when police close ranks, that's when they develop mistrust in the community. Rather, you know, where if it's open, this went wrong, we can do better. That's a much better way to approach it. Yeah. Yeah, like with any work environment. I mean, we know what it's like when something goes wrong at work and somebody just wants to deny it and not accept, you know, not take responsibility. Mm. You lose trust in that person. Mm. You don't necessarily want to kind of, yeah, they're not going to be the first person that you call upon in future. So I think it's yeah. the same thing with policing, that trust is a much better way to the relationship with the community is a lot better. Mm. than mistrust well exactly i just don't mm. think they get the right training because they must come they'll get complaints all the time surely mm. uh, whether they're warranted or not they just don't always seem to handle them very well Especially yeah no. involves this kind of thing yeah they should be open should release the footage they should you know be open about it and or like have a consultation with Tuck as to what he thinks would be a right way to kind of move forward from this. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, Tuck might not even want the footage released. I don't know, but whatever it is, it should just be work working to move forward and grow grow from it. It's not just uh shut down like shut it down. Yeah. No harm done. See ya. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see you next time until next time uh, yeah uh, anyway that was a good story that one yeah thanks. thanks for that what we do and that's the end of season three for this year we're going to take a bit of a break focus, yeah. focus on some other things some other projects and but it has been really lovely chatting to you on the airwaves we can call it that. Yeah, thanks for inviting me along for season three. I love the stories. I've said it before, you know, it really expands um, some of, you know, what I'm thinking about and seeing on a daily basis. And it's good, yeah, it's good to kind of always be mindful, isn't it, about all this and grow and learn and do better. And yeah, so thanks yeah. for inviting me along for a ch chat. And it's been nice because, you know, you're a friend as well. So I enjoy catching up with you. Oh, it's been the oh. same. You're one of my best <laughs> friends, Lou. Yeah, but I'm here. <laughs> and you're on the other side of the world. So I probably won't speak to you as much now. It's sad. No, I know. It's a bit, yeah, it's difficult. Like I said, I get homesick. Mm. Oh, anyway. Anyway. All right. Well, let's wrap it up until maybe we'll speak again yeah. on, the, on the podcast. 
Yes, thank you so much, Tracy. Oh, thank we you. We will miss you. Thank you. I'll miss our chat. Looking forward Bye. to season four. Bye. Season four. Bye. Bye.